The name of the talk is From Tapestry to Dataviz, Networks of Collaborations in Project Cornelia. And so the main, the kind of guiding question um, behind this paper and behind this talk is really about the the way in which we can ensure the relevance, the dissemination of work in multiple um, disciplinary fields, right? So we're doing collaborative work where people and collaborators from multiple different disciplines, how can we ensure that the work that we do is relevant in all these different disciplines, um, is disseminated throughout these different disciplines, and how can we also ensure or maybe at least reflect on the long-term usability, on the long-term usage, and on um, the sustainability of the tools that we develop? So that's going to be the guiding question for this talk. And I'm going to be talking about kind of four main different components. Uh, the first one is really just giving a very short introduction to Project Cornelia because yeah, I, I know it very well, uh, but I assume that that's not the case for uh, the people that are listening to this talk. So I'm going to quickly introduce Project Cornelia without getting into too much detail, and then I'm going to talk about the collaborative process, the kind of interdisciplinary work that we've been doing in between art history, um, human-computer interaction, information visualization research. The next part will be about sustainability and about long-term use of uh, of these tools and the concept that we introduce of digital satellites, and then a short word on um, using Project Cornelia as also a tool for education. So very quickly, Project Cornelia is a um, digital art history project um, hosted at the KU Leuven in Belgium. The main goal of Project Cornelia is a kind of using technology, using data science, uh, data visualization uh, to support a study of 17th century Flemish tapestry and paintings. So that's the main kind of research focus, the main application domain, the main kind of material that we are looking into. And the question was also to see how we can use technology, how we can use digital tools to support that. This is very zoomed in, but maybe this is going to be better. Um, oh, voila. So, again, the main research question of Project Cornelia was to support kind of a distant reading of, um, well, basically, and let me phrase it a, a bit differently. The question we were trying to look into is how the socioeconomic realities, the socioeconomic um, practices, uh, dynamics of 17th century Flanders was affecting artistic development and cultural production. So there's a lot of effect, like from a, a materialist um, art historical approach, there's a lot of effect that the social practices, that the economical uh, yeah, dynamics and realities will have on cultural production. So we were trying to see how we can support that analysis by using digital scholarship, basically. Throughout this process, we uh, coined the concept of slow digital art history. Um, and here, this is a whole quote from the article where we introduced the concept, but I just want to highlight the second part of the paragraph that reads, we simply want to highlight that our use of digital tools when we're talking about slow digital art history is preceded, inspired, and fueled by the time-consuming process of searching, collecting, organizing, processing, um, the vast amount and wide array of our archival documents. And this process is, for all intents and purposes, slow. So what we're trying to do here, again, as it uh, says in this paragraph, is not to kind of disparage or make a um, sort of competition between a digital art history that would be going too fast or that we would have any critiques towards um, and paint this as a kind of, yeah, a better way, let's say, but to introduce the idea that we can do digital art history or digital humanities in general in a way that um, basically continues, that honors and that supports the, maybe what we want to be slow, what we want to be very methodological, uh, very purposeful, very, you know, step by step. We don't necessarily have to bring in the methodology from more of a tech research. We don't have to bring in a model, feed it some data, make conclusions, jump into the other model. What we wanted to do is really just slow it down and 
continue with the practices and uh, the approach that we would have had in a in a art historical um, research project. So now that I've introduced a little bit the concepts behind uh, Project Cornelia, I hope that this was at least enough of information to get into the actual topic without just you know telling you all about what happened throughout the years of this uh, project. I want to talk a bit about the process, so the collaborative aspect of this project. And so this, um, Project Cornelia, there's a few people who have contributed to it of many different backgrounds. So I'm going to give you a quick uh, little description of uh, what that is. So the main PI of the project was Kunrad uh, Brossens, who is an art historian. And we have a few art historians in the group who have more, uh, some who use more analog kind of uh, methods and some who use more digital methods. There's a wide variety of practices and we allow that and we kind of, we, we want that. We, we, we need that kind of um, variety and uh, practices in the in the project. So uh, that is the, so the art historians in the project uh, are Kathleen van der Siegel, um, Astrid, Clara, Jos, uh, Jos, and Ines, who are all art historians. On the other side, we have people who are like myself, who are coming from a more of a computational uh, background. So. Catherine, Bruno, and myself uh, were the people who are originally studying human-computer interaction, studying uh, or doing more empirical research on what the what digital tools can do in in any kind of domain, and for myself particularly in art history. So uh, we've been studying visualization, we've been studying human-computer interaction, interfaces, perception, usability, and all of that. And what we wanted to do is bringing that type of questioning into this digital art history project. We've also had the fantastic support from the KU Leuven broader digital humanities community, and that's a community that's been growing and that's doing really fantastic work. Um, particularly Margarita Fantoli, who is a co-author of this article, um, and the library community, of course, who have been a fantastic support for us. Um, in the last year or so, they've also been building a lot of, of new research and kind of services to support digital humanities scholarship. So this is a photo from a hackathon that they've organized. Uh, last year. Was it last year? No, it was uh, um, yeah, a bit earlier this year, I think. Um, so yeah, this was called the Bibliotech Hackathon, and it brought together people from the libraries, uh, archives from the libraries, materials and collection, together with students and researchers from bo both uh, humanities, from history, from literature, and also from the digital humanities masters that we have from, um, yeah, more um, computational uh, background as well from human computer interaction and viz and gave birth to a lot of really cool projects a lot of interesting and fun uh, collaborations as well and potential collaborations so i've spoken about the the fact that we want to use a um, a digital approach to really support art history research but that we also want to somehow found, find a way to contribute both to art history and to human computer interaction and viz, right? Because that's the, what the challenge can be sometimes. We can use existing methods and um, use them to see how they can support an art historical research, but then that's not really necessarily a contribution to the human computer interaction field or to the viz field, because if we submit that to a viz venue, then they're not really interested by it. It's just using a tool that they already know on some new data. And the same uh, goes for the other side as well. So the way that we have that we have kind of modeled this is that we start with our research question so the goal of developing a distant reading of the socio-economical realities um, of 17th century uh, Flanders and then we say okay how can we really answer that well first we have to collect a lot of material right so we have access to archives from the cities um, mostly from Brussels and Antwerp and we need to collect them, to clean them, to make them into data, right? To so start from material, start from scans, and then see how can we model this in a, a database or a format that we can do computational um, work on. So that's the uh, step in the middle there. Sometimes this thing has a laser. I'm not going to try it. Um, and then once we have that data and that material, we can use that to, uh, well, basically, Answer, try to answer our research question. We can see what kind of digital methods, what, 
methods we can use to answer our original questions. And yeah, we've used tools like Tableau, like Kefi, um, our packages, Excel, everything that we have access to that can allow us to look a bit more into this data and answer our research question. And it is in this way that we do our slow digital art history research that we've therefore um, been able to um, publish in art history journals, including in more traditional art history venues, which normally um, have been a bit difficult for us to publish in because reviewers aren't necessarily interested in what they can see as something flashy and gimmicky and that doesn't really bring anything to art history. So the kind of, of findings that we've had with this process were interesting enough and were enough of contributions to the art historical um, uh, journals that we were able to publish in those. On the other side, um, once we've collected all of this data and kind of datafied it, we also noticed that a lot of the existing tools don't really work. They don't really help us do anything with this data because the data is very complex, it's very nuanced, it uh, holds scans and personal relationships and biographical data, contexts and images of paintings and tapestries. This is not very easy to just plug into Excel and get something that you can make something out of. So what we found is that we actually did need to develop new tools to develop um, new technologies, new interfaces that are specifically custom based, um, custom built for the material that we have. We've therefore uh, also had to test and critically interrogate these tools. Are we just making new tools because for the sake of it or so that we can publish in this venue, for example? That's not what we want to do. And so we can, again, critically engage with the tools that we're building to see if they bring something new, to see if um, maybe they bring some perceptual effects that maybe we don't want because if we're visualizing information, we're bringing in an extra layer of, of a mental model and maybe, maybe we don't want to do that. So the second or parallel process is the process that brought us to also be able to contribute to human-computer interaction venues and to information visualization venues. So we have built uh, tools, we've developed kind of theoretical frameworks, we've developed uh, game, gamified um, interface to explore the data, and this kind of parallel and collaborative work that was all done at the same time in the same office really brought us to something that we feel is very true to the goal that we had, which is to contribute at the same time to very different disciplines and also create a bond, create a collaboration that is um, in, in which we learn from each other as well and we learn from the different processes. So that was for uh, the collaborative aspect and actually working on this project for a few years and developing all these tools, it's, it's very easy to see, and I think this has been a topic throughout the whole conference as well, that not all of these tools are basically going to be sustainable. Not all of them are going to survive. The funding will run out, and it has run out actually. Um, and then it becomes sort of the job of nobody in particular to hold on to, this, to these technologies. So this is a question that we've had to kind of face at some point. <coughs> discuss the, the sustainability of these tools. And another thing that we were um, finding is that also if we look at the literature, there's so much discussion about the digital humanities and the tools we built in the digital humanities as either something that is really promising, that is the future of, of the disciplines, that is going to change the humanities as we know it, and on the same time, at the same time, discussed as like, basically gimmicks. We're building a lot of random tools that, that are not going to last, um, and that therefore don't bring really as much as maybe the, the effort that they take or the funding that they take. So the question was, again, how can we make sense of these two fundamentally opposed ideas that are living together at the same time in the same field? We have uh, looked into the... Um, uh, or used a bit the metaphor um, developed by uh, Hinrich and colleagues where they actually um, describe this kind of technology more on, in the field of visualization, but we've uh, looked into it in general for the tools we've developed, um, that developed the metaphor of sandcastles. And the idea here is that sandcastles are something that take a lot of effort to build, that are very intricate, that are kind of very beautiful and mesmerizing, but they are going to be washed away at the first or second wave that comes in. So this is a very interesting article that we kind of looked at when we were building these tools. Are these sandcastles indeed? Is that what we're spending all this effort building? 
And what we, um, the, the direction we took or the reflection that we were having on this topic is that actually all of these tools don't really go away. They don't. We, we were building them. It's, it's not necessarily that we're going to use them for 20 years. A lot of these are prototypes or proof of concept and are not really actually usable by a wider community. But it's also true that they are still there in the ecosystem. They are still there in our kind of collective uh, scholar memory, let's say. We reference them in um, papers. We, in meetings, we're like, oh, there was a tool developed by this uh, team and this um, location and we look for that article online or we look for that tool and often it's defunct and we can't use it but often we can find screenshots in an old paper or in an old report and we're like yeah this was interesting maybe we can do something about that so we developed the um, metaphor we've built on this sandcastle analogy to develop the metaphor of digital satellites in humanistic research and the idea of the digital satellites is that it's quite similar to the satellites that we have in the sky. We build them, we put a lot of effort, a lot of money into them. Some of them, you know, they're in orbit and they're allowing us to, you know, to use GPS and to move around and to know more about yeah, the weather or the skies or um, all kinds of different things. But some of them are just out there and they're, you know, they're in a kind of a, a yeah, sky graveyard of, of, of trash, basically. We have built them, we have put all of that effort into them. It's not that everything will uh, bring you something back. So we've built a bit this analogy to think, okay, we are building these tools. We will hopefully be able to continue to use them. But if not, the main re question became, how can we make sure that they remain useful even when they stop becoming usable? So when we're not using them anymore, when they're not usable, when they're not accessible, when the, the libraries that are used to build them are not working anymore, we are still accessing them. So we want to make sure that that all of this end of life uh, period is not basically for nothing. So these are a few examples of the satellites that we've built for Project Cornelia. We have some that are more uh, to explore the data, some that are more kind of for, on a, for a general public to really learn something about the collection. <clears throat> and what we have done is um, just go through the different phases of digital satellites. So the first phase of design and launch, which we're always excited about, and we come and we present these tools. Um, it's a phase that's characterized by a lot of optimism, where we kind of can see, if, is this going to be realistic? Um, yes or no. We can estimate the costs. We can estimate the technical constraints. The second um, phase is the phase where the tool is actually functional and operational and is used for the goal that it had. Our hope when we're designing these projects is that this is going to be the longest period of uh, a lifetime of, a, uh, of a, a digital satellite, but it's not necessarily the case. And actually, most often, as for technology, as for the satellites that are in the sky, the end of life period is the longest period. That's, that's the real, actual main phase of any technology because that's going to last for maybe hundreds of years if we're talking about physical objects, whereas the actual, for example, time of use of your phone will be a few years and then it's going to uh, stay somewhere um, in a dump for um, long, long after that. So what we wanted to do is design for this end of life and think what can we do right now when we're designing the tool to make sure that this is a period where the tool isn't rotting somewhere uh, on, a, on a GitHub page or on a pixelized version of it exists in an old report, but where we can make use of it as legacy. And so we have three principles uh, that we've developed that are a bit more uh, detailed that I'm not going to get too much in detail to, into now, but that are more detailed in uh, the paper and in the reference that I uh, cited. So the three main principles are to anchor the gravity center. So whatever it is, the collection, the material, the actual, um, uh, yeah, the actual center of the research, whether it is uh, physical materials, whether it's an infrastructure database, for example, that we are accessing, we make sure that we use something that is stable, something that can last and that we can rely on. The second principle is encouraging satellite longevity. Um, and in um, encouraging satellite longevity, what we uh, include, for example, is also the fact of 
building tools that have an autonomy built into them for the scholars, right? That don't, necess that don't necessitate a computer scientist for every small update, for every little um, maybe content difference. The third principle uh, that I have here is supporting long-term function, and this is again the idea of thinking of the end of life phase as the longest, most stable phase of any digital tool. Um, and in this, we uh, include principles like archiving the design, because when we refer to a, a tool, often what we want to do is just see what, what it looked like, what type of features it had, because that's where a lot of effort goes in these projects, to have this kind of collaborations and try to understand what the features need to be, what the, what the options need to be, how this needs to interface with the data, what it needs to look like. And all of that we need to still keep, because the prototype can die and we can build another one if we still have access to this research, to this really fundamental output um, that we spend effort building. So archiving the design, archiving the process and requirements, open access code, of course, um, and the last one is uh, considering taking down non-running tools. We often do this, I have been guilty of it, where we develop a tool and then we just don't use it again because it was a prototype and then people want to refer to it and they get this link and it doesn't work and it feeds into this um, kind of vicious circle of people having more of a reason to be a bit uh, suspicious of all of this digital uh, research that we do and scholarship that we do because they see all of these kind of non-functional links, works, that tools that don't really work. So uh, the last principle was to consider taking these down. Maybe in the link where the prototype was functional, you can have the actual requirements, the, the videos or um, examples of how interactions work. We can have the process, the requirements really, really well and thoroughly described so that Again, we focus on this as the main output, this research, and not the, um, not the maybe just the functional uh, tool, whether it's functional or not anymore. So a quick last word on um, how we use Project Cornelia for education, and this is also a way to also frame this as one of the outcomes and one of the main maybe outcomes of this uh, digital scholarship that we're doing. We've used the data that we've spent this much effort building and datafying and building a database for. We've used it also in teaching, so in uh, for students of digital humanities with really great results um, because we've built the tool, right? And then we can use it um, to support uh, teaching students data cleaning, teaching analysis, statistics, um, all kinds of scholarship that we want to teach at this level. And this is an example from a, a student's work um, that is also, again, one of the digital satellites that will have orbiting the project, maybe for the duration of the project, and then after we want to make sure that we keep the, the strongest, the most important aspects of this work um, in around the, the Project Cornelia. So I will end there. I want to thank you for listening and uh, I am very open to questions and discussion and anything else that come from this. Thank you.